<laughs> Hello, everybody, and welcome to another wonderful day of chemistry. So today we're going to be looking at phase diagrams. So the big thing about phase diagrams is they're a very simple pictorial image where you can go ahead and look at the pressure and the temperature of a system and figure out exactly what phase, what substance your material will be given will be in at any given point. So one of the reasons why this is really important is we found four different phases that can all coexist solids, liquids, gases, and supercritical fluids. So what's going to be really useful is if I have, I'm able to simply tell which one will be present at any given set of conditions just by a quick glance. And so all we have right now is essentially a series of equations. So for example, I know I can figure out whether I have a liquid or a gas by looking at the clausius clapeyron equation. That will show me essentially what vapor pressure a substance is at at any given temperature. If you're below this pressure, then we're only going to have a gas. There simply isn't enough substance to form a solid. If you're above this pressure, well, that means I'm going to start forming a liquid because I'll have enough material. It will start condensing. Similarly, we can go ahead and uh, generate an equivalent for the clausius clapeyron equation for sublimation. Only difference is now you're going to have a different reference temperature and pressure, referencing a solid instead of a liquid, and you're going to be using the enthalpy of sublimation, which we can get from the vaporization and uh, fusion. Now, again, the presence of a liquid or solid, essentially whether I'm sublimating or vaporizing and which phase I'm coming from, is just going to be determined by the melting point. If you're above the melting point, you're a liquid. You're below the melting point, you should be a solid. However, one of the things you should watch out for is as you increase the pressure on a system, that melting point can increase or decrease to make uh, to favor the more stable phase. In general, if you're very dense, pressure tends to favor you because as you compress the systems to uh, compress the molecules together, high pressures, you'll favor the more dense species. And finally, we know that above, if you're above the critical temperature and the critical pressure, you're going to form a supercritical fluid. Well, so far, this is a bunch of numbers. It doesn't give me a good instinct for what's going to, when I'll have any of my given four phases. So what a phase diagram is, it simply summarizes all of these relationships. I can go ahead and, again, looking at the uh, phase diagram for CO2, just take a quick look. And anywhere I see a solid, region, this shows where I'm only going to have one phase present. So in this graph, uh, brown is going to represent I have a gas. So if I have, say, one ATM, any temperature above negative uh, 78 degrees uh, Celsius will form a gas, just period. And that's very useful to know. Now, if I go ahead and look at these lines, this tells me where I'm going to have at least two phases present. Because again, if I'm at 1 ATM and 78.5 degrees, this would be again the boiling point of, or the sublimating point of CO2. This means I'm going to have both solid and uh, gas present simultaneously. And you can do this to figure out solid and liquid, liquid and gas. However, things get a lot more fuzzy up in the supercritical point. And again, <clears throat> If a solid or liquid is exposed to air, so let's say I go ahead and I take my dry ice, so that's solid CO2, I expose it to air, I'm going to quickly generate enough gas until I reach that pressure. So if I have dry ice, it's going to keep on forming a gas until I've reached a par uh, partial pressure in the air of one ATM. This is the reason why if you want to keep dry ice solid, you put it in an enclosed container. That way the air is quickly saturated and both phases are present at once. It stays at a given, at a constant pressure and we prevent it from warming up because it'll stay under those fixed conditions. <clears throat> uh, and similarly for a liquid. So this is one of the reasons why water evaporates because it's going to keep uh, if I have an open lake or aquarium or anything, it will evaporate to keep producing water vapor until we've reached that saturated levels. Now, one of the things that is worth uh, 
noting is that this only applies if I leave the system out long enough. So if I leave a lake exposed to air long enough, I will completely evaporate the lake. So this really helps illustrate the fact that phase diagrams tell us what a substance wants to do, not uh, what it actually will do. So liquids will keep evaporating until they reach that vapor pressure. However, again, that assumes enough time. However, if you're working in an enclosed container and you let it sit, this is actually a pretty good indication of what will happen and what will be present. One of the other things, as I mentioned previously, watch out for that supercritical phase. It gets very fuzzy because we know at the supercritical point, we start making the supercritical fluid. But if I increase the pressure and not the temperature, I may still generate a gas and vice versa for the liquid. So again, you often need to increase both and supercritical fluids by their very nature get a little fuzzy and confusing. But they at least gives you an area for where you need to watch out for their formation. <clears throat> so, one of the other really important defining points besides the supercritical point is what's called the triple point. So this is where my solid liquid, my liquid gas, and my solid gas phases all come together. So whenever I'm at the triple point, it means that all three phases are present at once. Now, this seems like a very odd sort of point, but it turns out it happens all the time. Uh, so if I have, say, uh, ice water, if I leave ice water, say, in a sealed container, it will essentially start evaporating until the gas is at the vapor pressure. And I have a solid and a liquid both present at the same time. This means that I can guarantee, uh, I can for sure tell you the exact temperature of the system because it will be what's often defined as the melting point temp. So whenever we refer to melting point temps, we're usually really talking about the triple point temperature because that's where our sol liquid uh, phase diagram will begin. Now, the other important part about the triple point is the pressure. So the triple point pressure is going to relate to the pressure of that gas above that sol liquid mixture, again, if you let it sit long enough. Now, the last phase we really want to talk about is the division in between solids and liquids. So in general, we tend to think about solids and liquids having a fixed melting point temperature. However, as I said previously, one of the things that happens is as I start pressurizing the system, well, it's going to try and push all the molecules together. And for most substances, what this ends up uh, doing is favoring the most dense substance, which is typically the solid. So for most cases, solids tend to be denser than the liquids. And so as you pressurize the system, you're going to increasingly stabilize the solid, and you'll essentially uh, result in freezing the liquid. Uh, <clears throat> as a result, it tends to become much harder to melt liquids as you get to higher and higher pressures. And this is one of the reasons why, if you go ahead and look at geology, if you put anything under high enough pressures, doesn't matter how high the temperature is, you tend to form solids. And that is very worth noting. However, there are some notable except exceptions to this conditions. One of the most famous, which is water. It turns out that liquid water is less dense than ice. And as a result, if you go ahead and pressurize uh, ice, you can start to melt it. <clears throat> and this is, again, due to that lower density of, uh, of ice. If you don't believe that ice is uh, less dense than water, go ahead, throw some ice cubes into your uh, glass of water or some glaciers, uh, some icebergs into the water. You'll find ice floats to the top, less dense. It also turns out that this property of water often becomes important in some oceanic processes. Because as you go deep into the ocean, the pressures quickly mount very high. And as a result, you can get to temperatures that, uh, uh, water temperatures that are lower than you'd expect to be stable. You can get below zero degrees Fahrenheit because the pressures get so high and water just isn't dense enough. Now, you may notice on this phase diagram that if you get the high enough pressures on uh, water, something very weird happens. It shows that there's many different allotropes of ice. So as a reminder, 
An allotrope is uh, simply a different way of arranging uh, molecules or atom inside a solid. So the most typical form of ice we encounter is called ice one. However, it turns out that you can change the configuration of these molecules and you can get up to 17 forms of ice have now been identified, each with a slightly different configuration, each with a slightly different density. And again, each with a slightly different stability to temperature. So it is worth noting that most of these allotropes tend to only form under very extreme conditions, but they do play a key role in the formation of say ice in space, where you can get to some very cold temperatures or some very high pressures. But one of the coolest features of ice is it turns out that some of the forms of ice can actually be formed under glaciers. So if a glacier gets high enough, you can actually change from ice one, the form we're, comp uh, we're familiar with, to ice two or three. And so if you, uh, and these uh, different ices will be more dense. And this means that the ice will start to compact. It will shrink, which means that the glacier starts moving. And it turns out that some of these form uh, allotropes of ice have uh, play a key role in the movement of glaciers as they move forward. It's one of the reasons why we, uh, why glaciers are always talked about moving forwards and backwards. It's because of the formation of some of these exotic forms. However, it turns out many other different materials have lots of different allotropes and you can figure out which one will be state the most stable by looking at phase diagrams. Again, another famous class of allotropes is carbon. So just a single atom. And it turns out that again, if you go ahead and take the most stable form of graphite under room temperature and pressure, or of carbon under room temperature and pressure, it's carbon, or it's graphite. Graphite is way more stable. Uh, <clears throat> but if you heat it up high enough, again, above 4,000 degrees Kelvin, you can go ahead and vaporize it. And this is used in some industrial processes. Now, the part that most people care about is diamond. Diamonds are exotic, diamonds are expensive. And one of the reasons why is they aren't the most stable form of carbon <clears throat> until you end up reaching above a minimum of 10,000 ATM. Do note that on the left here, that pressure is in gigapascals. So 10 to the ninth pascals. So again, diamond doesn't start forming till over 10,000 atmospheres. And most of the time you have to get it even higher to go ahead and require a phase change. So diamonds don't form until uh, in the earth until you reach very high temperatures and pressures, and then you suddenly cool down. So it's caught for a moment in that lattice. And then it takes a long time to become the most stable phase. And we'll talk a lot more about these kinetic processes uh, later in the semester. However, next time, we're gonna go ahead and try and look very carefully about the structure of solids to figure out why is graphite more stable than diamond? and many other crystal forms. Until then, take care.